Hello, Mage fans. This is Adam Simpson for Mage the Podcast. Last time I spoke on the show, I was talking about adventure writing, and uh, I'd like to continue with that topic today. Uh, Now, first off, why do I call it adventures instead of stories? Uh, Story and uh, chronicle is the proper term used in World of Darkness uh, published books, but uh, I prefer to use the word adventure. Uh, Even though I like the word story, adventure is a more uh, vague and open-ended term, and I think that is uh, more helpful for me when I am uh, uh, writing adventures for my players. And the reason I like to stick to that term is with a story, uh, it's very easy for us to get into a mindset where we expect the storyteller has an obligation to write a really good story. And if that story is good enough, and if it's executed well enough, the players will have a good time when they come for the game session. But even though there's truth to this, I think that people fall into that mode of thinking a little too easily. Uh, When you think instead of the term adventure, uh, you start thinking of uh, older, more open-ended uh, modules written for role-playing games years ago, where the expectations for everyone were a bit different. Uh, in that situation, the game master was supposed to have an idea of uh, what was going to happen in the game session, but the players were also expected to bring something to the table. They were uh, partially responsible for what was going to happen uh, in the session. Uh, that evening. So uh, I like to use the term adventure because it puts a little less pressure on the storyteller writing the perfect story and puts a little more of the uh, possibilities onto the part of the players. So just my thoughts on the subject. But uh, at any rate, uh, last episode, I was giving advice to uh, beginner storytellers and uh, Uh, Beginner storytellers are often thinking about uh, what published um, adventures are out there for me that I could try, uh, what is some good advice on planning an adventure, and that's why I spoke about that last time. But uh, this session, I would like to uh, speak to the intermediate storytellers, and an intermediate storyteller has run a few adventures and is pretty comfortable with the process, doesn't really need advice on uh, how to plan an adventure, but they are always looking for ideas. And so tonight I'm going to offer a few ideas on adventures that uh, either I don't hear about at all or I I don't hear about as often as the standard format, uh, which I discussed uh, last episode. Now, let's see. I'm just taking a quick look at my notes here so I can get my thoughts together. One style of um, adventure that I really don't see much is uh, what I call the globetrotting adventure. Uh, What I hear of quite often is the storyteller will uh, plan out a location uh, for the adventure and put a lot of thought into what NPCs are nearby, what is the mood and theme of this place, and they, they keep focusing in on one spot. But in a globetrotting adventure, the cabal of mages is uh, moving from place to place. Uh, They're moving around the world, different countries, very different uh, regions, geography, types of people, cultures. And this can be very interesting for the players. In fact, you could even pin a different location to each game session so that uh, it's it's really mixing things up and um, just opening up all kinds of possibilities that uh, I don't here used all that often. Uh, Now, of course, the first option for that would be a normal travel where the Cabal of Mages are moving around the world uh, by normal means, uh, uh, buying plane tickets or by ship or uh, even by car or train. This shouldn't be ruled out. I think a lot of uh, especially beginning mages are probably going to get around in that way anyways. And uh, the different needs of each location is going to keep them on their toes. But also, if you want to uh, make things a little more interesting, you could say that they are 
uh, using uh, portals, uh, magical portals, to move around the world more quickly. Uh, this can be not only more interesting for the players, but it can also uh, be very helpful to your plot if they need to react quickly to um, news that they just got from a faraway location or if they're dealing with an opponent that can move around the world quickly, then they can react uh, with these magical portals. Now, instead of expecting the players to be able to teleport their whole cabal, uh, which is very difficult for mages to do, especially when they are just uh, starting characters, it can be a lot more fun to... Uh, give them a letter of introduction or two to different uh, tradition chantries or technocrat chantries if they're technocrat characters and at each chantry there's a portal that they can use and so in that way the players can not only uh, move through each step of the adventure that you have planned for them but also they have an opportunity to see different uh, chantries around the world and uh, learn how very different those chantries can be from the one that they're probably used to. Uh, you can have uh, small or large, uh, old or new, weak or, or powerful chantries, all, all different uh, arrangements there. And at each spot, uh, they can be challenged by um, an umbrewed guardian of the portal um, in either ritual combat or uh, riddles or other kinds of puzzles. Uh, they can be challenged by acolytes serving the chantry, and they have to show the proper proof or uh, give the proper argument for why they should be allowed in. And uh, I, I just really see a lot of possibilities there to learn how different life can be among uh, different uh, chantries, different uh, locations where mages congregate. I think a lot of times uh, the players will uh, start out from a chantry and then go out to different adventure locations and they kind of get this uh, idea in the back of their mind that all chantries are more or less like the one that they came from. So uh, I, I really encourage uh, storytellers to uh, open the doors or the portals in this case to a lot of different chantries and let people see what's out there. And a uh, third option for a globe-trotting adventure would be to steal a page from Books of Magic, which was a DC Vertigo comic uh, written by uh, Neil Gaiman. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the detail about that comic, but it did have one idea in it that I thought was pretty interesting. There was mention of a um, something like a synchronicity highway, and that is a magical, naturally occurring phenomenon where um, if a mage uh, is aware of it, uh, he can use this phenomenon to travel around the world very quickly. Perhaps he needs to use some magic of his own to activate it, perhaps not. That's just uh, details you can work out. But um, an example of this would be um, once a mage knows how to properly use the synchronicity highway, then to start on that highway, he would have to, or the group would have to go to a place where people normally go when they're going to travel. I'm talking about uh, uh, airport or um, you know a shipping port, uh, even a, a hut by the river where the ferry boat comes, um, bus stop, train station, any place like that. And uh, they would have to uh, navigate just a part of that. And then before they knew it, they would be... Uh, on an airplane at night over the Atlantic or in a train going through uh, Germany or um, a riverboat uh, somewhere in China crossing the Yangtze River. You know, uh, they have a lot of passenger ferry boats and things like that over there. And so by shifting from uh, place to place, from uh, you know transport to transport, a mage can move to the other side of the world in just uh, an hour or two, or maybe a few hours or something like that. And uh, this can be a very interesting process to describe to your characters. And of course, one question that comes up uh, right away when you talk about something like the synchronicity highway would be, well, why isn't every mage doing it? Why does any mage bother with uh, uh, hail hailing a cab or uh, learning correspondence magic to move around? And one idea is you could say that the player cabal learned about this synchronicity highway, but when the technocracy 
rose to ascendance and uh, started really dominating the sleeper paradigm of the world, the synchronicity highway stopped working. It closed down somehow and mages just could not activate it anymore. But the players uh, come into contact with some rare information and they learn that the synchronicity highway is still there but uh, it has not been used by mages for some time. Uh, they simply have to um, learn a certain effect or uh, make the right umbrewed creature uh, happy. Perhaps they um, talk with a messenger from an umbrewed lord and uh, learn that if they go to a certain place and um, promise a service to an umbrewed there, then they will be given a key. And from then on, they can use the synchronicity highway. They can use this to move from place to place around the world to pursue the um, steps in the adventure that you give them. Uh, towards the end of the adventure, they find out that they are in possession of very valuable knowledge. They are the only mages alive uh, at this point in the setting that know how to use the Synchronicity Highway, and they learn that there are a lot of other mages out there that are willing to pay quite a bit uh, to uh, get the secret from the players, or uh, willing to send some opponents to beat it out of them. So this can add a little interest to uh, the later part of an adventure that you're running uh, for your players. Just an idea. Uh, another thing that I have not heard about, but I got to thinking about this week, was uh, some sort of uh, moving ship uh, that the a cabal could be on. For example, an ocean-going uh, regular sort of ship, and the players could set up shop uh, right on that ship. Each player could have a um, spot on the ship that would serve as their own sanctum uh, so that they could keep all of their less portable uh, foci and you know, magic uh, tome library and, and all the sorts of equipment and, and uh, laboratories and things that they need could be just right on the ship, and they could move around the oceans as they uh, follow out the steps of the adventure you have planned. And this appeals to me because I, I've read a number of uh, older uh, fiction novels where there's a lot of uh, high seas naval adventure. So um, for those of you who have uh, read similar stories, you can work in a lot of those elements, make them a, a part of your adventure. Now, moving from there. A uh, natural next step would be something like a, a blimp or an airship, which is getting a little more out there, but uh, you could say that it is a uh, enchanted or somehow enhanced air uh, vessel that uh, is, is harder for people to detect. Uh, for example, if, if a mage can have arcane, maybe there's a way to put arcane on an airship. I don't know, just a thought. But uh, in that way, the mages could move all about, and they wouldn't be restricted to where there's water. They could move over land as well. And that gives them uh, not only a means of moving around, but also a vested interest in keeping control of their vessel. They might have to defend it against attackers or... Uh, get rid of a uh, bomb that an enemy has placed on it. There's all sorts of ideas you could work into an adventure without really altering the adventure, but adding some flavor to it. And last, of course, would be the deep umbral ship. This is an idea that is mentioned in several of the mage supplements. Uh, a son of Ether uh, or a technocrat vessel that can uh, you know, ply the... Uh, depths of the deep umbra moving from place to place, or even one that can venture into the uh, near umbra, um, perhaps the high umbra or even the, the middle umbra. Um, this is an idea that appeals to a lot of people. Um, with this ship, you could move between horizon realms, uh, move between uh, umbral realms, also encounter all kinds of uh, real strangeness out in the deep umbra. Uh, now, the one thing to keep in mind if you're uh, working with an umbral ship-based adventure is it can be quite easy to fall into the familiar ideas of uh, science fiction stories and, and movies. And I think it's usually a mistake when someone takes their favorite uh, science fiction game or science fiction story and tries to recreate it 
uh, step by step in Mage because there are a lot of good science fiction role playing games out there, and uh, you know I'm not going to give you a list right now, but uh, they're not hard to find. And if you're looking for a science fiction game, you can have a lot of fun there. But with Mage, there are so many things in the setting that can really you know break the mood for you. For example, if uh, you've got a bunch of Void Engineer um, NPCs uh, manning their ship, and the players have managed to somehow, uh, you know, get berths on board and travel. Uh, you can get into a mindset where it's like a Star Trek or a Star Wars sort of uh, scenario. But then you're going to have a um, spirit shaman from the Dream Speakers wearing nothing but uh, a pair of shorts, and he's running through the deep umbra and doing quite all right without a spacesuit. This is the sort of thing that can happen in Mage, and it can break the immersion of a, a science fiction story pretty quickly if you're not careful. So something to watch out for. I think a, a umbral ship adventure could be very cool, a lot of fun, but uh, just don't try to recreate Star Trek and Mage because, yeah, there's a few snags that'll that'll throw you. Uh, moving along to another kind of adventure is uh, what I call player initiative, and that is where the storyteller doesn't actually write a story, but sits down with the players and asks, what would you guys like to do? What uh, What are your goals? Uh, I think that uh, very seldom uh, players of mage think about the cabal. Instead, they tend to think in terms of just their mage and uh, sometimes what they can do with the other players at the table. But uh, if you can get your players to think in terms of the good of their cabal, then they will start having ideas uh, that can really work their characters into the mage setting. An example of this would be, we want our cabal to gain prestige uh, among the other uh, nine traditions of the council. And uh, we, we want to really make a name for ourselves. That way it's easier to get allies, to get contacts. It's easier to learn about interesting things happening in mage society, uh, you know, get better um, talismans in trade, and um, be invited to more interesting um, chantries. Uh, another uh, goal for a cabal would be to establish themselves at a large, more powerful chantry that has more to offer in terms of uh, defense and training and possibilities uh, for future adventures. Um, if your players try to establish their own chantry, it's going to be a, a pretty small um, pretty small affair with very little in the way of resources. But if they instead were to show up on the doorstep of, uh, say, Doisetep, the uh, hermetic uh, large and, and powerful chantry. They could show up there and say, hey, we, we are um, a really happening cabal. We've got a lot to offer. If you give us membership in your chantry, then we'll perform these services for you or share this knowledge that we've gained. Uh, also, if they've really got some temerity, they can say, hey, give us one of your nodes on Earth and membership in your chantry. That way, uh, we've got uh, better mentors and better allies, and we've got... Uh, some uh, tasks, you know, free quintessence that uh, comes to the node that we can use for ourselves. And in exchange, we'll do this for your chantry. Oftentimes, uh, what you're going to see is if you ask your players, hey, what is it you guys want to do? Uh, you might get a lot of uh, individual players saying, well, I want my character to get this or learn this or go to this place. And um, it's not such a bad thing, but it is very common for players to think in terms of uh, just their own character. And so if you've got four people at the table and they all want to do something totally different, then it's hard to base an adventure on that. And that's probably why so many storytellers say, look, here's the story I'm offering you. Why don't we you know, discuss this? But a lot of times you can take the individual uh, desires of the players and, and work them together. I'll, I'll just give one quick example before... Uh, moving on, and that would be, uh, say you've got one player very interested in this storyline, they really wanted to uh, focus on that. But that's a sandbox uh, chronicle happening in a big city. Uh, you don't have to uh, 
uh, go to a big city every time you want to plan a sandbox. Um, a different example would be a wilderness area. Uh, picture a, uh, a remote jungle in Southeast Asia, perhaps in, in some corner of uh, the map of Laos or, or Thailand and uh, possibly Cambodia. W one part of Cambodia where there aren't so many landmines, hopefully. But uh, in a jungle setting, you could have uh, the first situation be a uh, bastet, that is a uh, wild cat uh, shapeshifter uh, out in the jungle who has uh, her den there. And she uh, learns about the mages uh, after they arrive on the scene and appeals to them for help. Uh, perhaps uh, there's some umbrood interfering with her den realm, or uh, perhaps she's uh, having trouble with a group of uh, were spiders, and if you've looked at any of the supplements for uh, the werewolf game from World of Darkness, you'll know that the were spiders are pretty scary and and pretty strange opponents. So uh, you can probably have a lot of fun uh, putting were spiders against your uh, players. Uh, probably something they were not expecting. Now, in another corner of the same jungle, you could have a progenitor research outpost that uh, is small, uh, experimental, has a small staff, and uh, they're starting to cause problems uh, with their uh, long-term research experiment, uh, modifying genetic samples uh, from the jungle. Perhaps they've created some creature that got loose or Perhaps they have accidentally created some sort of uh, airborne virus based on tropical plants that's causing uh, illness and killing off animals and, and people. Perhaps they're causing trouble for a uh, uh, Laotian village uh, that they're uh, nearby. Also, in another part of the jungle, you could say that um, those mages who have access to time magic or some talisman that can do it for them, will learn that a stone obelisk is probably going to appear very soon. And this obelisk is something that appears in remote areas around the world every 300 years. And whenever it appears, the spirit world is thrown into chaos. It's a nexus for magical energies and causes all kinds of problems. And uh, finally, in another corner of the jungle, uh, there are there's a sleeper village that's in an uproar because rumors are flying about an angry god in the jungle that has taken up residence. And uh, perhaps that's a marauder, or perhaps that's uh, some creature that escaped from a progenitor laboratory. Uh, you could uh, put any sort of, of character in there. But this jungle setting would be a place where the players can move about uh, between the different situations. Each situation would have its own NPCs, its own enemies, its own uh, interesting locations. And these situations do not have to have anything to do with each other. They don't need to be part of a greater story. They can be separate, unrelated things, and the players can solve them in any order that they please or move back and forth between them. And uh, as you're running the adventure, you might find that two or more of these separate situations uh, have possibilities for um, combining. Uh, perhaps once the players learn more, they discover that uh, one situation is caused by the other, or that uh, one is a deliberate distraction to keep them from solving uh, another of the situations in there. Uh, finally, I wanted to throw out an idea that really appeals to me. I really like uh, playing with Umbral Realms in my mage games. Uh, I really like the supplements put out for first and second edition about um, adventures in the Umbra. So naturally, when I thought of a sandbox environment, I thought of a way to allow a cabal of mages to move back and forth between realms. And uh, so I came up with um, the mages learn uh, that there is a special um, thing in the Umbra called the Hierophant's Altar. And the Hierophant's Altar is a very small umbral realm in the High Umbra and it's really no larger than, say, a, a large room. 
And once they get access to it, they find that in the Hierophant's Altar mini realm, there is a large stone chair and there is something like an altar or perhaps a small high table. And on this table, there are different uh, uh, jewels, uh, mystical uh, stones that when arranged in a certain order, uh, they will open up a uh, portal uh, on the wall and each time uh, the portal will go to a different place. You could say that the first portal uh, opens a door to an abandoned horizon realm. When the players get there they find that it used to be a euthanatos chantry, uh, quite a powerful one, but uh, it was abandoned and it was, it's been abandoned for some years, but they don't see any signs of a struggle. They don't see any bodies or any signs of anyone uh, being injured or anything burning down. It's just empty and very quiet. So naturally the players are going to start wondering, well, if this is such a, a nice chantry, why was it abandoned? Uh, is, is the cause of this problem still lurking somewhere around here? That would be a mystery for them to try out. Uh, rearranging the stones on the Hierophant's altar would open up a second door to the Temple of the Burning Wheel. The Burning Wheel is a college mentioned on page 59 of the first edition Mage uh, core book. A college is a sort of cooperation between traditions in the Council of Nine, uh, where they come together to uh, pursue a common goal. The Burning Wheel uh, has a lot of mages from the Celestial Chorus and the Order of Hermes, and they want to um, discuss the possibilities of uh, researching new kinds of magic and opening up new possibilities uh, for the Council of Nine. So the Temple of the Burning Wheel would be a uh, Horizon Realm Chantry, and when the players get there they find that the Mages there are arguing about uh, different visions and prophecies and, and uh, suggestions uh, they've got from Umbrood about a coming umbral storm. And so all the mages are talking about how to prepare for it, what it might mean. Is it an actual storm that's going to ha go through the umbro, or is it just a, a sort of metaphor? And I'm really not talking about the uh, Avatar storm from uh, revised edition mage that uh, changed so much of how the umbra worked for for mages. I, I'm, I'm talking about uh, something a lot smaller and less earth shattering. But still, storms can go through the umbra and uh, make things difficult uh, for a time. And uh, these storms uh, sometimes have causes behind them. Perhaps the uh, lords of the Oneira, the dream realms, are having a a problem and this storm results to that or maybe the umbral courts are behind it. Uh, there's a lot of different ideas there. Once the uh, players get to the Temple of the Burning Wheel they could learn more about that chantry and what's going on there and perhaps even make some friends and allies there. The third umbral door would take them to the dreams of a 15 year old girl in rural Australia. That's probably going to throw your players for a loop, not a place they probably expected to end up going through an umbral portal. But um, I, I, those of you who are familiar with the Sandman comics, also by Neil Gaiman, are probably uh, remembering one of the books where there was a very similar idea there. It's okay to steal ideas for your own uh, chronicles. Uh, for this idea, uh, once the mages walk into these dreams, they get in contact with this uh, teenage girl and uh, they start having to ask the questions, well, why are her dream realms so much more solid and why do they have so much more magical energy inside them than regular uh, sleeper dreams? Uh, what What is special about this girl? Or perhaps she's come into the uh, ownership of a, a special sort of uh, item or a talisman that she doesn't even know is significant, and that's behind this. Uh, a lot of different possibilities there, and uh, this could also give you the opportunity to have some some very odd and, and humorous uh, discussions there with the dreamer. But uh, for the fourth possibility, a door opens up to the City of Dust, a very old city in the Umbra that has been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's it's an abandoned, decaying city uh, that has been abandoned always. Uh, there uh, will be written uh, 
accounts by uh, mages from before the Middle Ages who went to the City of Dust and uh, saw it. And, uh, of course, these written accounts would just be uh, something that mages know about. Sleepers would know nothing about the City of Dust. But uh, So there's some background about this place. The, the traditions would be discussing this for hundreds of years. But for some odd reason, for the past uh, 60 years, uh, no one has been able to reach the City of Dust. That's been inaccessible. And these things happen in the Umbra. It's a very strange and, and ever-shifting place. But once the players get to the City of Dust, they find it matches the description. But there are signs of recent habitation. Someone has been here. And it's hard to tell, of course, in an abandoned, uh, wrecked city if they're still present or not. But how is it that they got here when no other mage has been able to get here for 60 years? That could be another mystery for your players to look into. So these are just some ideas uh, that I wanted to throw out for um, types of mage chronicles that I don't hear about as often. Uh, now, of course, these ideas aren't uh, solid gold, but uh, if my ideas give you some ideas, then I did my job. Hopefully you'll get something out of this, and I would like to hear your ideas for interesting and offbeat Mage Chronicles. Perhaps you can let us know at Mage the Podcast uh, what games you're running for your players or planning for the future. Well, as I sign off, I'd just like to let all of you know that you can find us online at magethepodcast.com. You can listen to previous shows there, and uh, also interact uh, with those of us who host episodes. Also, you can follow us on Twitter, at Mage the Podcast. The discussion is always going there. Please subscribe to Mage the Podcast on iTunes. You can also give us a review on iTunes. Uh, as I often say, if you've enjoyed the show, there are probably other people who would enjoy it too. And if you review us on iTunes, you make our show that much easier for other people to come across in their own searches for good content. Uh, you can also find us at Google Play and the TuneIn app. So it's nice to have all those uh, different options. Well, I hope you have some good uh, stories that you run for your own players. I'm going to go plan a few more of my own. This is Adam Simpson speaking for Mage the Podcast. Have a good week, everyone. Bye-bye.